Hello and welcome everyone to tonight's uh, Goodfellow webinar with Dr. Mark Fulcher. We're going to be discussing osteoarthritis and uh, how to manage that in primary care. So with that, we'll hand over to Dr. Mark Fulcher, who's a sports and exercise physician at Access Sports Medicine. So over you, Mark. Yeah, thanks very much for the introduction, mm -hmm. Vicky. So um, this, uh, this talk today is, is really about talking about the different treatment options for managing osteoarthritis and trying to be pretty relevant and, and uh, in line with the Goodfellow theme of Skills for Monday, so trying to give you some practical feedback that we can use uh, in our clinic rooms. Um, look, I think when we when people talk about osteoarthritis, and certainly when I talk to patients about this, they uh, have this kind of, um, I don't know, this negative look in their face. They look very gutted, and I try and actually avoid using the, the word osteoarthritis and talk about cartilage injury uh, because this is the sort of image that I think most people conjure up in their head, you know, an older person who's quite disabled, um, who maybe has a joint that is, that is pretty badly damaged and, the, and an outlook is very poor. So I think that's what a lot of people think about when they think about osteoarthritis. But, you know, I think this might be more the reality and, and particularly with um, so patients that are more active that are potentially um, becoming injured younger. So they're having meniscus surgery or they may have an articular cartilage injury or an anterior cruciate ligament injury. We're seeing osteoarthritis in younger patients um, probably more than ever. And so um, there is a big gap, obviously, between a patient that has some cartilage change in their 20s, you know, through to, you know, their 80s and 90s when, uh, you know, their life ends. So that is a gap that we really, really need to be thinking about how we, we fill that and how we manage that patient through that time. Particularly given that a lot of younger active patients may also have physical jobs. And so it's not just an impact on their sporting life, it's an occupation on their working life, social life. Um, it can be a big impact. So... I think that's an important consideration. Um, and unfortunately, I think pa these patients often get told that. So um, they will often be referred to an orthopedic surgeon and the, the orthopedic surgeon knows that their joint replacement isn't going to help them. Um, they generally know that their arthroscopy, if there is some articular cartilage change, is probably not going to help them. And so the patient goes away, I think, often um, with, the, with the feeling that nothing can be done. And I think what the orthopedic surgeon's often doing here is saying, look, I don't have an operation for this. Um, I'm not sure uh, that I can help you rather than saying, look, there's nothing that can be done. Because as I, I'd like to try and uh, show you, hopefully over the next 20 minutes or so, there are lots of things that we can do to help try and manage this problem. So, you know, I, when I think about a problem, I think about the simple things that are easy to do and then um, work up through uh, things that are more invasive. And so generally lifestyle, um, lifestyle treatments are kind of down the bottom of the pyramid, but pyramid because they tend to work pretty well and they don't have uh, too much morbidity associated with them uh, and we're working our way up through surgery and I think this way of thinking about the, the treatment of uh, osteoarthritis is uh, is quite a good way to go about it. So if we think about what that actually means um, from a lifestyle point of view we know that there are some things like weight loss that work really really well. Um, medications are really widely prescribed in primary care and I think um, sometimes patients have the impression that uh, the treatment uh, from their GP is an anti-inflammatory. So they maybe that's the, the key piece of advice, as opposed to often when they go through um, a physiotherapy type approach, it's much more around some of the hands-on type of treatment. So I think often that's better received because there's a, a perception that something's being done. Yeah. So I think patients do like that. Um, there are a variety of uh, injections which, as we'll see, have some real limitations, but they are something that we can use to help get a patient back on track. And then at the top, surgery, I've, I've mentioned their joint replacements because I think they're the most widely uh, used, certainly with kind of more end-stage end arthritis. Um, in some situations, an osteotomy or fusion. Um, and in some situations, an arthroscopy uh, could be considered, but the, the evidence in, for osteoarthritis is extremely limited. So if we just maybe talk a little bit about these options, so um, lifestyle options, I think are where in primary care with the biggest um, potential impact. The first and I think the most important thing is to really explain the problem. So as I said, patients really find the word osteoarthritis quite threatening and quite negative. And so I try my best not to use that first up and I'll talk to them about some uh, cartilage damage or some post-traumatic cartilage damage if they've had a previous injury. And I think um, sometimes just explaining it using those terms is a little bit less confrontational 
I think sometimes when you say osteoarthritis, the patient's eyes glaze over and they start thinking about um, how this is a really bad thing for them. I think it's important to explain that while the patient has symptoms now, it doesn't mean that they're going to have symptoms in two or three months. So we know that most people with radiological changes of osteoarthritis actually don't have symptoms. So one of the things to explain is there is absolutely the possibility that we may be able to manage these symptoms and the pain may largely settle down. On the other hand, it may be that these are to some extent long-term problems and with any other long-term condition, you know, think about diabetes, mm -hmm. it's about selling that to a patient saying, look, this is something that we're gonna to have to manage over time. There are some things that are likely to aggravate your knee and we'll need to do less of those. And there are some things that your knee will really like. And it's about finding a bit of a balance there so that the, um, the knee or the hip or, or the big toe, I've had a bit of a sore big toe myself and uh, you get no love for a sore big toe. No. no but uh, I can tell you it's pretty dis disabling yeah. at times. So setting up some real uh, realistic expectations, explaining that it's not all doom and gloom, but explaining that there may be a need over a lifetime to manage these symptoms, I think is really, really important and is often not done well. It's uh, the implication sometimes is you've got a normal joint or you've got a joint that needs a joint replacement. Sometimes people don't understand there's lots of things in the middle. One of the most effective interventions is uh, losing weight. So you don't need to be morbidly obese to get some benefit from this, but Anyone that has uh, an elevated BMI or you know, maybe even at a relatively normal weight could expect to get a diff uh, an improvement in symptoms by losing weight. And there's a great study that looks at a 5 to 10% weight loss equates to a 50% reduction in symptoms. And if you correlate that with some of the best studies that look at non-steroidals, um, non-steroidals taken regularly have a 25% reduction in pain. So if you look at someone who's 100 kilograms, if you can help facilitate them getting down to 90 kilograms, usually by being a bit more active, um, paying more attention to weight, sometimes in the short term being quite aggressive with your weight loss advice, then you can expect to have a substantial improvement with their pain. They're less sore, they can become more active. If they can become more active, the, the muscles function better around the knee and the symptoms improve. Um, so really pushing hard about weight loss and doing that in a respectful way, but being upfront about it, I think is really important. And I think if you can approach that in a, in a kind of non-confrontational way, but also be very clear about the potential benefits, I think most patients um, can buy into this as, as part of a, a broader treatment strategy. So it's not just about weight. Um, and we also know from a, a variety of studies that most patients with arthritis don't get good, good advice in this regard. So um, looking at potentially involving a, a dietitian or someone who's got a specific expertise here, but also there's some good online um, resources and some really good apps that you can help there. I wonder just with that with weight loss, mm. obviously, you know, it's a really big benefit compared yeah. to, or much better than most of the drugs quite hard for some people to achieve a 10% weight loss. Yeah. Um, talking about the apps and the online programs, are there any that you sort of recommend as uh, favourites or well, anything like that? Um, I'm, I'm quite lucky. In, in our yeah. clinic, we yeah. work with a, a dietitian. So we have a multidisciplinary arthritis clinic. So um, we have a dietitian, a, an orthopaedic surgeon, sports medicine physicians, and an exercise physiologist. So um, perhaps I could, um, we could put that out through the Goodfellow Twitter account. Yeah. Um, yeah, there are a couple right. of, of really good apps there. I just uh, I can't remember the names. No, that'd be, that'd be great even if we could put them up on the website after yeah, the talk. Yeah, yeah, so no problem It's just at all. an area that's often difficult to, um, you know, talk about in a short consult and if we can give them something to take away. Yeah. Um, so I'm not, sure, um, I'm not sure if the, the guys out there use Twitter, but social media can be quite a good way to get this type of information. Um, and so I use it just to follow uh, certain journals and things. And yep. so... Um, I, I saw uh, something today about using exercise to um, prevent or delay joint replacements. So mm -hmm. if we can get people to be physically active, yeah. you are two thirds likely to delay uh, the need for a joint replacement out to two years. Right. So that's okay. a, a little social media right, thing. Right. There. So yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> anyway, no, great. Yeah. Um, so uh, so uh, diet and weight loss certainly are important here, um, but so is being physically active. So. Um, this is an interesting study that doesn't look specifically at people um, who have arthritis. It looks at the effect of running and walking on arthritis. So I think there's a perception perhaps that people wear out their knees by running and being physically active. But the evidence doesn't really support that. And it's sort of running per se, as long as you aren't injured, 
is generally good for your articular cartilage and likely prevents uh, the likelihood of developing arthritis. So in this study, um, runners were much less likely to get osteoarthritis um, and they were less likely to require a joint replacement. I mean, the interesting thing about the study is it wasn't dose related. So as long as you were a runner, um, it didn't matter how far you ran, that's you were protected. That's encouraging for us 5K uh, social <laughs> yeah. runners, isn't or it? Or even yeah. you know, a mile a day can make <laughs> yeah. quite a big difference. Sure. Um, and so uh, this was largely related to weight. So um, if you run, you generally have a lower BMI sure. um, and you're less likely to have uh, cartilage problems. And this is different actually to um, change of direction type sport like netball or rugby or football. So those sports largely um, are associated with an increase in arthritis risk, which is likely to relate to the incidence of injury. Um, interestingly, though, playing professional football increases your risk of developing arthritis by about two times, even if you remove the, um, the effect of injury. So oh, just yeah. the act of playing lots of sport over your lifetime with change of direction mm -hmm. may, may be bad for your joint, but sure. on the other hand, you're not putting on weight. So being active, so there are some things that once you have arthritis are likely to be better for your knee um, than others. So a lot of people I see are you know, addicted runners and they know that they can run a few times a week if they ride a bike a few times a week. So riding a bike, we think, improves the quality of the cartilage and sometimes can patch up some of the, the chondral defects. The cartilage is aneural, it doesn't create pain, but the bone underneath is highly innovated. So um, on an MRI scan, you'll often see there's a cartilage defect underneath the bone, looks very, very uh, unhappy. There's a lot of increased signal there. And so the act of getting your knee moving, whether it's on a bike or whether it's in a swimming pool, this is an aqua jogging belt, this blue thing. So you put it around yeah. your weight, right. uh, put it around your waist, jump in the deep end and start running. So you're moving your knee in a way that doesn't hurt your knee. And um, those things in the acute setting can be a really good way to get the symptoms under control. Um, and in a more long term, if you combine some things that your knee or hip likes with some things that you like, then um, that can make a really big difference. I put this weight in there because um, some strength and resistance training improves the muscle function around the knee uh, and is a, is a sort of shock absorber for the knee. Um, so this is the sort of type of exercise that you might talk to, talk to people about. And in fact, any physical activity is good. So encouraging patients to get out and walk, even if it hurts a little bit, is good for the life of the joint and is good for the overall treatment. Um, so encouraging people to be active, even if it's a little bit sore is important. Um, advocating uh, the use of a stationary bike, so some nice easy spinning to begin with, so it's not going to do a big workout, the mentality is to polish your knee. Um, and in some of those pool based activities, just walking in the water, if you're up to your chest in water, uh, that removes about 80% of gravity, so your joints are much, much happier there. And in terms of intensity, being able to hold a conversation with someone but not be able to sing, if that sort of level of breathlessness is where you want to be. Um, and then with exercise, you want to advocate some form of strengthening. Um, when you're starting that, it's often good to get a bit of supervision. Often people, when they go down to their local gym, they're prescribed a bunch of heavy exercise. Um, often a leg extension exercise where you're swinging the weight out with your legs can be quite provocative. So those sorts of exercises can make people worse. So um, it's often a useful thing to get someone with some expertise involved. And again, in our clinic, we're really lucky. We have a, an exercise physiologist who um, tailors an exercise program, does some education and in some situations supervises that program. So um, that can be a really effective strategy. There are also um, some physiotherapy practices out there that have a real interest in this area. Yeah, so yeah, um, like in your community that too. might be yeah. more accessible. Yeah, sure. um, but as I said, you know, basically trying to do anything. So that relates to both diet but particularly with activity. So can you get out there? Can we encourage movement? even if it hurts a little bit. Um, but as we're going to see in a minute or talk about in a minute, sometimes people are just too sore and we need to do something else to be able to facilitate these things. Um, smoking, you know, smoking generally is not good for you. Um, and, and there's some evidence, although it is a little bit more debatable, I think, than with some of the other things we've talked about, that people who smoke maybe have worse uh, cartilage disease and have more pain. So um, it's a bit more ammunition potentially to talk with your patients about not, not smoking. Um, and one of the last things, these braces, uh, if people have uh, isolated arthritis in one compartment, so they have predominantly, say, medial compartment osteoarthritis, this brace here is for lateral compartment arthritis, so it's kind of a three-point system where it's trying to open up the lateral compartment oh, okay. here. Yeah. 
And so for patients that have uh, pain in certain situations, so um, sometimes you'll see someone that's addicted to golf and walking around the golf course is no good, they might get a good relief from wearing this brace. Whereas people that have it you know, all of their life, all the time, you're probably going to get a less good benefit. One of the main issues here is that they're quite expensive. They're about $1,500 for this type of brace. Oh, wow. But um, the most of the brace companies will give people a trial for a month. If they don't like them, they'll oh, refund okay. the money. So um, it might be something that patients could try uh, and then not stuck with it and, and the cost of it if it doesn't work for them. And how would they accept that? Uh, well, so that's something that we refer for quite a bit. Right. So if they've got health insurance and they've got uh, a, a knee problem um, and they're referred to us, we can generally get this under their insurance. Mm -hmm. um, otherwise, they can buy these sorts of things online. The, the main downside with that is that it, they can be difficult to fit. Um, sure, or some of the yeah. orthotic companies um, uh, sell them and prescribe and fit them. So um, you can refer patients to the ortho orthotist for okay. this type of thing. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it will cost you $1,500 yeah. and uh, you want to be clear about that first. And it, it also is not a guaranteed fix either. Yeah. So it's, it's, a, really it's a, yeah, yeah, it's a tool you have in your arsenal. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so we kind of, we've done lifestyle interventions. Um, I'm wondering if anyone's got any questions on that or? Yeah. I, there are a couple about um, weight. Someone suggested the MyFitnessPal app, which yeah, you're, right. we're back so to it's more of a, tracks you. That's you know, right. So um, some macro, people. Micronutrients and things. And, yeah, yeah, that's right. So sometimes people really like that sort of thing. Another thing that can be quite good is um, something with a pedometer in it. So people like yeah. tracking their steps sure. um, and it can become a little bit addictive and yep. you find yourself at 1135 <laughs> trying to get your <laughs> last 2,000 steps. steps. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So they can be quite good too. Yeah. Um, do any uh, comment on walking and running, whether they would have the same kind of effect, I guess, that means yeah. for, for pain? So running um, is generally pretty provocative. Mm -hmm. So if you think right. about what happens with your body weight, so obviously you're standing on your feet, um, weight nice and evenly distributed, you've got about you know 50% of your body weight going through each leg. Yep. If you start walking, it's somewhere between two and three times your body weight with each foot strike. Whereas if you're running, jumping and sprinting, it can be up to 10 times your body weight. So right. The analogy I talk to patients about, you know, like if you run, it's like hitting your knee with a hammer. Um, whereas if you ride a bike, it's like massaging your knee. Right. So That's I'm not right. saying don't run um, because sometimes people can run if, they, if they're kind of uh, aware of their overall loading in a week. Yeah. Um, but it's much more likely to be provocative. And if someone's really struggling, I'd say running is unlikely to be good for them. Walking may be okay, um, but cycling, swimming or pool-based activity are going to be better. Okay, yeah. Sure. And any, um, no, I think that's sort of how much exercise. Yeah. I think we talked should about we that a couple of times. Trun, but yeah, should we move, along, move yeah. along and then we'll see so what So if we get. look at medications, so um, not really medications, yeah. but supplements. So almost every patient that I talk to asks me about supplements. And my, my feeling is that these are generally worth a go. Um, they don't have too many downsides. They don't have much evidence to support them. Um, but I think it's really important to be aware that some of these things are quite expensive and you don't want to be uh, prescribing things unnecessarily and leaving people with a big bill. Uh, but, you know, fish oil, really widely uh, used and tried. Glucosamine uh, has had some evidence. Um, turmeric and, and these sorts of things are, are all worth a go. But you just need to be aware that, that the evidence is pretty lacking. Um, and, you know, glucosamine is probably the best single example. So there's initially some really... Uh, promising study results in a randomized controlled trial that showed that a lot of patients with arthritis did get better, um, but then that was uh, an industry-sponsored study, right. and then um, there was an a independent randomized controlled trial that showed no benefit over placebo, so the conclusion there was that this does not work. But if you look at the study, 60% of people with placebo had a symptomatic benefit, so um, my feeling is that placebo we know works. Um, and so I encourage people to, to try it. I write them a prescription. Um, and you know, I say, well, look, buy it from the supermarket. You're aiming for 1,500 milligrams. Um, don't spend more than $20 for your two months. Um, try it for two months and stop. If you think it's been good for you, then by all means, keep going. If you don't think it's helped very much, then probably it's not working for you. So I have a fairly sort of pragmatic approach and I sort of I kind of like the idea of placebo. I find it fascinating. And so, yeah. you know, it's probably just placebo. But on the other hand, um, it's not going to do any harm other, doesn't... other than the bank account. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, there yeah. are some side effects, but they're pretty um, few and far between. 
So um, glucosamine, we, we you know prescribe a lot of analgesics. Um, we as um, general practitioners, sports medicine um, practitioners, um, but increasingly, I think we are aware that there, are, there is a side effect profile with those, and uh, increasingly, we're probably aware that paracetamol, mm. particularly, which um, generally will often prescribe first because we think yeah. it's safer, probably doesn't help too many patients. So. Um, a zero to four percent chance of being effective is pretty bleak. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, but then if you look at non-steroidals, they're very likely to help. Um, and then I, I always talk to patients about the potential side effects and talk to them about the cardiovascular risks and talk to them about the you know, gastrointestinal renal risks. But um, if your option is be increasingly sedentary, do nothing, there is a cost to that as well. So you, it's not good for your cardiovascular well-being, not good for your psychological well-being. And so it's kind of a, like a what's the, the lesser of two evils. And so I think you want to use the smallest possible dose you can as infrequently as you can. Um, but, you know, I don't think that anti-inflammatories are as bad as perhaps, you know, we all think they are. But I think it's important to be mindful that they're not great either. Um, other medications, so amitriptyline and nortriptyline, sometimes people will get you know, a lot of sensitization. They'll be very, very sore. They'll get some allodynia. They can't tolerate the sheets on their legs. They don't sleep very well. Yeah, that sort of night pain and waking up. Yeah, so well. I think amitriptyline, nortriptyline is quite a good medication sometimes in the setting. Um, it can help with sleep. If you sleep better, then obviously your perception of pain is uh, is better. So I think that they can be quite useful. Um, there are some small print studies looking at bisphosphonates and other types of medication. Um, but generally, you know, these are by far and away the most commonly prescribed types of medication. And I think, you know, they're very appropriate in the right setting. Um, looking at uh, injections, so there are uh, there are several types of injections. So um, most of us, I think, are, are very familiar with corticosteroid injections. Um, the main limitation there is that while they're very likely to help with your pain in the short term or the patient's pain, um, they're very likely to give short-term relief. And so I think that's a really important thing to stress to the patient that while we're treating the inflammation, we're treating the synovitis, we're treating the pain, we're not actually treating the underlying problem. And so when I use corticosteroid injections, I explain to the patient it's a means of trying to turn the clock back. They've had a, a, an acute flare. We're trying to get things to settle down so that they can work on their weight loss, they can work on their strength, they can do those other lifestyle things. Um, the actual steroid itself and the local anesthetic that we often inject with the steroid is not good for cartilage. So if someone has, uh, say you're dealing with a 23-year-old who's had a partial meniscectomy when they're in their teens and largely has a pretty good knee with the exception of an isolated cartilage lesion, steroid is probably not good because it's not good for the cartilage. Generally, we're trying to facilitate them getting back to playing rugby or netball, which we know is not good for the cartilage problem. So I'd be really reluctant to use steroid in that sort of setting as opposed to someone who's 75, um, has some established, you know, tricompartmental joint disease or, you know, bad uh, medial compartment narrowing on an x-ray, their cartilage is likely to be pretty average and maybe the horse has already bolted and we're trying to improve function for day-to-day -day life. Yeah, sure. um, the final point there I've got, you need to think about if that patient is likely to have a joint replacement at some point in the near future, then maybe, maybe steroid is not the way to go. So. There's not good evidence for it, but you know, anecdotally, some surgeons don't like operating and doing joint replacements on knees when there's been a recent steroid injection or hips or whatever joint, because they think there's an increased rate of uh, of deep infection. Right. So that's not universal. Some surgeons aren't so worried about that, but that's certainly a consideration. Mm -hmm. So if the person that you refer to you is uh, you know really advert anti corticosteroid injections, yeah. you're not going to win too many favors or friends by by doing that. Well, that makes sense. Yeah. You yeah. look like you were going to ask a question. I well, I was sort of thinking about that, but yeah, just noting we have had a couple of questions about medications. Yeah. Um, and just someone pointing out the comp use of complementary medicines and interactions. Sure. Fish oil and warfarin being one of them that right. would be relevant in that older yeah. population. Yeah. Um, so, and, and you very good advice to just check, I guess, yeah. with the GP so first. Certainly, yeah. there are a range of potential interactions, and they're certainly not totally benign. So, mm -hmm. I've been aware of a. Uh, a couple of patients have had glaucoma, which may be related right. to glucosamine. Right. So it okay. is being aware of that, but I think the, the take-home message is generally they're pretty benign. Mm -hmm. um, but obviously, um, you need to think about individual settings. Yeah.
And yeah. Amy Triptoline, if you were to start that, would you, someone's asking about the starting dose. Yeah, so I you start um, I, the, yeah, I always start with half a 10 milligram tablet. Yeah. So start with five milligrams, um, explain that it's very likely, actually explain that it's possible that they may feel somewhat tired. So take it in the early evening, yeah. six o'clock. Yeah. They may have a dry mouth, take some water to bed. Um, and then increase to 10 or 20 or you know 30 milligrams. So okay, sometimes tongue and cheek increase either to get side effects or your joint feels better. So sure. you know, yeah. um, most I think most of us are probably pretty used to doing that. Um, this is something which um, we do see in general practice a bit. So the the concept here is something called visco supplementation. So it's a synthetic version often of hyaluronic acid. Um, these injections have been around for quite a while. Um, but for a variety of reasons, haven't really gotten a, a huge amount of traction. Partly some of the earlier um, preparations required three or five injections. So they're one, one per week, which was a bit of a, a put off for um, patients. And the earlier preparations also had quite a high risk of a flare. So um, about one in 1,000 patients would have their knee swell up for no good reason. It would, would look like infection and they would end up having to have their knee washed out. Right. Um, so not ideal, but... The sort of more modern preparations, I think, uh, don't have those same side effects. One injection. Um, and the evidence, while it's not perfect, it's similar to taking regular anti-inflammatories for around about 12 months. Mm. So a lot of, I have a number of patients that, you know, they uh, may be uh, thinking about, you know, playing another season of football or they like playing golf and then he gets a bit sore. So they get a benefit from this type of injection and they've had you know, multiple injections over time. So maybe every 18 or 24 months, they might come back um, and have another injection. So the main downside is a cost. Um, and the other thing, it, which is around about $500, so it's reasonably significant. Yeah. Um, it's not a guaranteed fix. Um, but in the scheme of things, it is something that can help symptoms quite a bit and allow people to stay active and, again, do the sorts of things um, that, they, um, that we know are good for their joint. Uh, this is a kind of more novel thing, so it's called PRP or platelet-rich plasma. So the concept here is that uh, in platelets, you've got some things that may have an anti-inflammatory analgesic effect. Um, so you take some of the patient's own blood, spin it down in a centrifuge and separate out the red cells, which leaves you the, the plasma, um, and you can separate out the part of the plasma that has a higher concentration of platelets. And so you can then inject that. It's usually you know, two or three mils. And there are quite a few randomized controlled trials that compare PRP with visco supplementation and say that it's more effective. Uh, and there are some position statements out of the American um, Society or College of Orthopedic Surgery um, that actively recommend PRP. Um, the skeptic in me thinks that PRP is mostly widely done in uh, parts of the world where medicine is very commercial. Right. Um, so the uh, you know North America and to a lesser extent Australia PRP is really common, um, but there are some randomised controlled trials that do show that it works. And in our clinic, we follow this one by Patel in uh, the American Journal of Sports Medicine, which was a randomised controlled trial for people with relatively early stage osteoarthritis, comparing a, a placebo injection, a saline injection with one or two PRP injections, and it showed that PRP was better than placebo, um, but one injection was as good as two injections. It's quite um, it's quite fiddly. So again, there is a cost associated with that. In our clinic, it's about $500 as well, similar to the the, um, the Synvisco or the Visco supplementation. But some patients really like the idea of, you know, it's more a natural way yeah, to try and fix own. this problem. Um, I would never do this without having tried the other things first. Right. So there are a bunch of clinics that sort of set themselves up as PRP clinics uh, where you go and get an injection. And I, you know, I think that that's not ever going to work, really. Um, in the media recently, we've seen some stuff around stem cells in Israel DAG. Mm -hmm. um, stem cells, there's no evidence at all really to support clinical outcomes for stem cells. Um, and the cost associated with that is about $10,000 on average. Wow. So. For my mind, it's it's uh, it's hugely commercially driven. It's not mm -hmm. necessarily in the patient's best interest. But certainly, if you've done everything else and the patient has the money to spend and they're keen, um, well, you know, it's probably doing them no harm. But on the other hand, it is unlikely to be doing them too much good, is my view. Um, so it's something to you might read in the paper. Um, and then we come back to surgery. We've sort of alluded to that a little bit. So. 
I think hip joint and, and knee joint replacements, ankle joint replacements, we're very familiar with those. Um, and certainly patients that have tried these things and failed, um, particularly when they've got increasing pain, pain at night, uh, and especially when they've got you know, some significant radiologic changes on an X-ray, um, these patients do really well with a joint replacement. Um, hip replacements, the recovery from is, is really fast. Patients wake up and they feel like their pain had gone. Um, they've got some surgical pain and hip replacements, people get going really quickly and their satisfaction is very high very early on. Um, as opposed to knee replacements, which um, can take a good six to 12 months to recover from. So patient, and, and it's not a normal knee. I think that's an important thing to really stress to your patients. Uh, if their symptoms are bad, then the joint replacement is a really good thing. But if their symptoms are sort of more, more modest, then the, the probability that they're ever gonna be happy with their joint replacement uh, is markedly reduced. Um, uh, with the knee, a high tibial osteotomy, basically if you have unicompartmental arthritis, so um, it's realigning the knee so that most of the weight goes through oh, the good half. The load, yeah. um, something else, arthroscopies. So I think a lot of people don't understand what an arthroscopy does. So if you have a meniscus tear, most of the time, all the arthroscopy does is remove the loose or unstable cartilage. So it's not making anything normal. So if you're in your teens, or sometimes if you have a cartilage injury that's associated with an ACL tear, it's possible to go and repair the cartilage, but otherwise we're removing loose or unstable cartilage. So number one, there's no rush to do that. So we can sit tight and see what happens with the symptoms. But also we know um, from some really good quality studies over the last five years, um, that at two year follow up, there's no difference between surgery and uh, non-surgical treatment. We know uh, there's a study that looks at sham surgery where they literally just make oh, a prick in the skin yeah. um, versus arthroscopy, no difference. Um, and then more recently, um, studies that look at patients that have mechanical symptoms and instability, so locking, catching, uh, feeling of the knee giving way, um, physiotherapy and movement can be just as good as arthroscopy for that. It doesn't mean that we shouldn't ever do it. So often patients are really highly symptomatic. And so if we remove a loose piece of cartilage, remove their locking, um, we can get them better quicker. Uh, and it can be sort of a salvage issue. So if patients are not going very well. They're young, they don't have many other options. And arthroscopy is still something that could be considered. But you want to be pretty upfront about the fact that you're not gonna get better. And so, um, I often have patients tell me about you know, how quickly will I recover after this arthroscopy? And you sort of say, well, look, I, I don't know. Um, some patients get better very quickly and within a month or six weeks, they're back to doing things. Other patients never have any improvement and some patients get worse. Right. So it really is about your patient um, selection when you're going for an arthroscopy. So um, we've got a, a few cases, cases to talk yeah. about. Yeah. This might address one of the one yeah. of the questions actually, so I'll, I'll leave that one for now. A couple more questions just about the um, yeah. you know the sort of ladder that we've talked about. I guess yeah. of advice. Um, lots of people being asked particular foods. Do you have any um, advice on that? Um, Patients asking what exactly should I eat? Um, no, I other than uh, eating questions. less. Yeah. <laughs> so um, <laughs> you know, generally we're talking. The main problem is that they've got an elevated BMI. Um, and so uh, some form of calorie restriction is important. Um, you know, like I uh, generally, some rapid weight loss generally is associated with rapid improvement in symptoms. Sure. Um, what you see in the, in the media is, you know, this diet, this diet, this diet, but it's not really about a, an individual diet, it's about losing weight. Um, and I really don't think that the type of food has too much impact on anything really, um, but you know, other yeah, people will tell you yeah. they'll swear black and blue that since they started eating more fish or olive oil, they're way better. But yeah. um, I, don't, I don't really have any comment on that. No, thanks. Um, any comment on flaxseed oil as, a, uh, as an alternative to fish oil? Tastes amazing. Does it? <laughs> <Okay>. No idea. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I put that in line with the other thing. So yeah. um, if you're interested in trying it and exploring it, then you know by all means have a go with it. Um, but you know, I, I'm not really aware of any evidence to say that it's sure. better than and anything else. In the manuscript, for example, yeah. for sure. Which, you know, yeah, yeah, that's right. Yeah. Absence of evidence doesn't mean it doesn't work. So um, if the patient's interested in it, um, it's definitely worth considering. Yeah. 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 Great. Any, um, I think, 
the other one that was mentioned was muscle extract, which I know did receive a lot of media attention <laughs> at some time. Yeah, but, you know, these things are out there, I aren't they? The patients, muscles, yeah. Yeah. Do you have to do the extract or are you just <laughs> yeah. talking about muscles? Yeah, I'm, not know, sure. um, I, I'm not sure. I'm not sure, no. Um, B venom. B venom, not sure. yeah, I don't know about that one. <laughs> Biomag, <laughs> yeah. No. Um, so, yeah, um, I'm not sure. Any comment on the sort of concept of prehab, you know, where you get fit, fit um, yes, you know, get definitely, a patient fit definitely. for so prehabilitation is undoubtedly a good thing to do. So it's about um, improving function. So I alluded to that tweet that I was reading. Yes, yeah. So um, we think in our clinic, and uh, the, the evidence kind of bears this out, that if you can improve people's function, um, number one, they recover better from surgery. Um, but number two, you might not need surgery. So but if you can, yeah. yeah, so we know that weight loss works. So the prehabilitation, so if we can make the muscles work better, if we can engage them into an exercise and uh, and diet change, they will lose weight. Maybe they don't need a joint replacement. So um, that is something that yeah. unequivocally is a good idea. Good, good concept. Brilliant. I think that probably covers off um, most of the questions. So we maybe we should move on to some cases. And yeah. Um, so um, this case here I chose because I think it it sort of illustrates. Uh, a lot of the, the type of patient that I would see. So mm -hmm. um, this guy was a 35-year-old ex-professional footballer. Um, so in his lifetime, in both knees, he had nine surgical procedures. Um, he was a, a guy that was, um, you know, he probably didn't get good education first up. And so he, he viewed surgery as being the ultimate type of treatment. And so he, and he also was very persuasive. So he would keep, you know, sure. um, asking for something to be done. Uh, and I think one of the problems working in a sports medicine setting is that your time is the enemy. So in primary care, you can sit tight and see what happens to a problem over time, whereas in a sports setting, there's a lot of pressure to do something. Um, so this guy, his problem was he, he'd finished his career largely because of his knee symptoms, and his goal was to be a career coach. And so the type of coaching he wanted to do involved being on the grass, just demonstrating, doing stuff all the time. So his knees were increasingly being a problem. And so this is uh, what his x-rays looked like at 35 years of age. So um, there's um, evidence of a previous ACL reconstruction, which happened in his, his late teens. Um, interestingly, in his later career, he also tore his ACL in his left knee, which was never really diagnosed, but uh, certainly it happened. The other thing we can also see is this, this really pronounced bone-on-bone um, -bone appearance to the x-ray. So um, for those of you that are not used to looking at x-rays, you can see on the, the middle of the image there, there's some space between the thigh bone and the shin bone. That reflects where the, the cartilage and the meniscus are. Um, to get this sort of x-ray change, you basically have to have uh, no cartilage remaining in the lateral compartment. So um, this is a really big problem. So he has pretty bad pain related to activity and you know, some reasonably significant um, joint space narrowing in both knees. So he's got a pretty big problem. So um, I guess the treatment for that is, you know, this education piece is really, really important. So we have to explain to this guy that this is a lifelong issue that he's going to have to deal with and manage to some extent for the rest of his life um, and certainly the rest of his playing career. Um, and then explain to him that this was not a surgical problem. This was nothing that we could do to make his knees better from a surgical point of view. Um, and so we talked a lot with him about exercise prescription and the need to do some different things to manage his symptoms. And so one of the things that were quite effective for him was um, for every session that he did uh, where he was loading his knees on the grass, he had to do a session where he did something nice for his knees. Right. So he, um, in his club, he brought an exercise cycle and so he would warm up in the morning on an exercise cycle, mm -hmm. do his session and then warm down again at the end of the day. And he found that Number one, it made his knees feel better when he started, but also made his knees feel better after exercise. Um, he used a bit of analgesic, so here and there he uh, would use a bit of pain relief. And he was someone that had a good response from a visco supplementation, the, the Synvisc or um, Duralane type injection. Um, and he would have one of those or has one of those every couple of years. So by putting that all together, he's been able to be the type of coach that he wants to be. They certainly are painful, um, mm. but largely he's okay. So he can yeah. do the work that he wants to do. He's got terrible x-rays, but his symptoms are now not too bad because he's developed this kind of equilibrium where things are, are kind of managed. Now, he might get worse over time. Sure. Um, but we don't know. So we actually don't, we're not really that sure about the, 
the progression or the radiologic progression of these type of things. So just because he has symptoms at 35 and a bad x-ray doesn't mean he's condemned to having a joint replacement at some point. It may well be that's where he's going, you know, common sense sort of would suggest that, but um, the evidence is not as compelling. Yeah, this concept of doing something good for your joint yeah. in so, addition to the thing that might... Um, yeah, yeah, so it's like a, it's like a bank account or a piggy bank. Yeah. You know, you're trying to put something in there for a rainy day yeah. and then you make a withdrawal, yeah. you've got to make a yeah. deposit as well. Um, and you know, this is really common. So um, we see a lot of patients that will have their ACL reconstructed in their teens. I saw a young woman today who's 13. She tore ACL playing netball. Yeah. She is going to have more than likely some osteoarthritis by the time she's 23. And she's got to be on the planet potentially for another 60 or 70 years. Yeah. So that is a challenging, challenging problem. How Just we going? notice actually one, um, I didn't think of this before, I was actually going to ask you this myself, was that um, your thoughts on the topical not yeah. steroidals. Uh, um, so I put that mostly in the placebo. Um, really? Part. Yeah. So the, the non steroidals penetrate the skin about half a centimetre to one centimetre. Oh, so if you have nice. a problem that's quite superficial, so for example, say your Achilles tendon is sore, yeah. um, then those can be those can be quite good. Mm -hmm. um, for joint pain and joint problems, not quite so good. Um, they can, you know, you know, when you rub, you, you hurt yourself, you rub yep. the skin. Oh, that so feels that better. Sensory, so that sensory yeah. irritation, counter irritants, deep yep. heat, those sorts of things. Yep. Um, what's that? Tiger balm. Yeah. They, they're all something that can help, but they're short-term symptomatic relief. They're not going to be fixing you. But you know, people put deep heat on, mm, allows them to I be like more it. active. So yeah. it's, it could be worth messing around with and talking to people about. Yeah, sure. Well, that's um, great. Um. Any thoughts on genetically um, predisposed osteoarthritis? Yeah, that... I mean, genetics are, yeah. are clearly linked with osteoarthritis. So, you know, patients sure. that, you know, they've got a family history. Um, even pe people um, who tear their ACL seem more likely to have family links or familial links. So right. oh, you'll often see a patient's, you know, they come in, torn their ACL, so is mum and so is dad. Right. So um, there's definitely a, a link there. Sure. Um, whether you can do anything about that, choose yeah. your parents better, but yeah. um, it is it is something that's that is uh, yeah. an, a, a, it is important. And when you're taking the history, asking obviously about your parents um, and uh, whether they yeah. had joint disease is important to think about. Yeah, the comment um, that's come in is just making the point that um, the case they're talking about is has occurred in someone who's slim and active and this guy you know, doesn't fit the yeah. usual. So his picture. problem is directly related to trauma. So right. I don't think it's genetics. Yeah. Um, I, I mean. I do know his parents. I don't know if they've had joints <laughs> replaced <laughs> either. But yeah. the, one of the interesting points about this case is this is directly related to trauma. So when you're treating these patients, this, you know, from a logistical point of view, this is an ACC problem. So if you're thinking about how you're going to access care, so this, say this guy needs a joint replacement, this very likely can be tied back to his injuries over time. And this is something that ACC will likely help him with. So if he's unable to work, um, there's some uh, support there. If he's unable to, if he needs surgery, potentially this can be done in an expedited way through the ACC system. So just because they have arthritis doesn't mean that it's you know idiopathic arthritis or related to bad luck. What yeah. you know, bad luck to get injured. But yes. it, if it's linked to an injury, then you may be able to access different levels of care for your mm -hmm. patient. So that's something I think to that's think about too. Yeah. yeah. Um, should we move on? Yeah. Yeah. Right. Absolutely. Um, so this next patient is uh, a very young man, 42. Um, anyway, <laughs> so he's active. Um, he's never had knee pain before, and he's come in describing a minor twisting injury. And since that time, he's had some really localized and reasonably significant medial knee pain and activity. So for me, I, I run an acute knee clinic, and so to be referred into that clinic, um, you have to have an injury of trauma to your knee, and it has to have happened within the four weeks of referral. Right. Um, and I get a lot of this type of patient. So they've literally never had a problem, and then suddenly they've got this new onset of yeah. often quite disabling pain. Um, and this is the, the sort of MRI scan that we might get. So um, that is a, a kind of more degenerative looking meniscal tear. So mm -hmm. instead of having a small a peripheral area of tear, it's delaminated and split a little bit more like a pita bread. Okay. And so that becomes a little bit unstable. And so sometimes as you're twisting and pivoting, that can become symptomatic. What we can't see on this particular MRI image, I don't think, um, is that there is also a reasonably significant um, chondral injury involving the medial femoral condyle. So some full thickness articular cartilage loss. Um, 
in this sort of area here, um, sort of the curse will come up. So in around here, which is the weight bearing surface. And so um, the meniscus tear is not the primary issue. Right. Um, the problem with this type of patient is um, they do have some localized pain. So you're mm. thinking this is likely to be a cartilage problem. They're often pretty disabled. We um, want them to go back to work and we want them to get their function back. And so we think, well, maybe they've got a meniscus tear, something that we could improve with an arthroscopy. Yeah. Let's get an MRI scan um, because that's quite a good way of demonstrating um, the lesion. And the patient wants to know exactly what's going on. Yeah. I hate hearing that. But yeah. anyway, um, so generally they have a normal x-ray. So you go from the normal x-ray into getting the scan. Um, and this is the sort of report you might get. Complex medial meniscal tear. Full thickness articular cartilage defect with subchondral reactive change in the weight-bearing portion of the medial femoral condyle. So what the patient reads is meniscal tear. Sure. And so often, um, you know, I think as well with um, the drive to have GPs ordering MRI scans, this is mm. becoming potentially more of an issue. Um, we need to kind of shut this down because the meniscal tear is part of a problem, but it's not the only part. And when from a decision-making point of view, um, meniscal tear plus full thickness cartilage lesion um, sort of implies this is on the spectrum of osteoarthritis. This is not likely to do well with an arthroscopy. Mm -hmm. um, however, um, that may be part of it, but I would consider all the other things first. So with this type of patient, um, I'd explain to them that certainly an arthroscopy is a, a thing that we may consider, but that the science says that there's a good chance that we won't make them better and we could make them worse. So it's about explaining that. It's about explaining what the surgery does and it's not making your knee normal. It's about removing loose or unstable cartilage. So we're not in a rush um, and we're trying to get, we're trying to turn the clock back. That's the sort of dialogue I have with them. Sure. This is new. Um, you had no problems uh, one month ago. This is an upsetting acute flare up. We're gonna try and go back to how you were um, one month ago. And so we're trying to manage pain. So some simple analgesics, getting on some anti-inflammatories, starting them to try and be more active. So I'm, I feel like a bit of a broken record, but can you get them on a bike or in a pool? Um, can you get them doing some basic uh, quad strengthening exercises um, and getting a physiotherapist often to help support that is important. Um, and often if we can kind of help uh, guide them through it over two to three months, this generally will resolve. The problem is at the end of that, um, some patients are no better and so uh, they may be headed towards a trial of an arthroscopy. Mm -hmm. If they have some mechanical symptoms, locking, catching, instability, uh, then an arthroscopy is more likely to be helpful. The other thing to keep in mind is if the patient's pain is relatively modest, so say they rate it at 8 or 9 out of 10, mm -hmm. the probability of making it better with an arthroscopy is much less, um, as opposed to say, look, they, their pain is three or you know they rate them as being three or four out of ten so it's crappy yeah. so you might make them an eight or a nine with so, an arthroscopy yeah. so your um their satisfaction is going to be directly related to how bad the knee was or the hip was to begin right. with yeah just a comment come in about meniscal tears and mm -hmm. the message that um some people have received um that it should be repaired urgently. Yeah. Is it always safe to wait? I mean, I guess in uh, this case you're saying that that is so, the primary problem. But yeah. It's so it, that is quite tricky. There is largely no urgency to deal with these things. So right. your main example, the the times when you might do something more acutely is if someone has a locked knee. So if their right. knee is essentially stuck in one position, usually they'll come in and they're unable to fully extend the knee. It's really stuck in a, mm -hmm. a bent position mm -hmm. and they can't bend it very much that potentially infers that they've got a displaced or bucket handle tear of the meniscus. That patient is really disabled and they're unlikely to be too much better until that it's unlocked. Sure. So um, it's not quite viewed as the surgical emergency it once was, um, but an arthroscopy certainly early in that type of patient is important to unlock their knee. The issue is that really is that meniscus able to be preserved and repaired, it's still chopped out. Yeah. So in term, so if, if it's, and then that's the other one, in a younger patient, um, we were really, really keen to try and repair rather than debride their meniscus, then um, early surgery is a good one. But the general patient, you know, with uh, medial knee pain, lateral knee pain after some sort of twisting injury. So the usual story is some fairly innocuous twisting injury may or may not have been too sore at the time. They go to bed, they wake up the next day and all hell's broken loose, swollen knee, localized joint pain. Um, that patient you want to sit on and uh, you want to try and help make them get better. 
Oh, that makes sense. How are we doing? Yeah, a couple more questions about particularly prescribing, and mm -hmm. um, I guess just getting some advice from your prescribing yeah, habits. Yeah. Would you always consider um, protection with omeprazole or a, a PPI um, with your non-steroidals? Is that a no, not, routine? No, not well? usually. So certainly if someone's had a, a past history of gastritis, number one, I'd be pretty reluctant to prescribe an anti-inflammatory, mm -hmm. but, you know, we'd talk about that. And certainly if I was going to go down that path, I would prescribe a PPI. Right. Uh, but I read something recently about how they're among the most over-prescribed drugs in the world. So um, I think generally um, I'm prescribing anti-inflammatories for a relatively short period, um, and I'm just very careful to talk about some of the, the potential adverse reactions and how to identify those. Um, but, you know, it's, it it's, makes good sense. If people have a history of gastritis, um, then, yeah. So um, you're assessing that risk. Yeah, yeah that's right. So I wouldn't routinely do it, but um, I would consider it for sure. What about TENS machines? Have you had any um, good experiences with those? Look, some patients really like TENS machines. Some patients really like acupuncture. I know that was another question. Mm. Um, again, if you look at the evidence for these types of things, the evidence is pretty tenuous mm. um, in terms of being clinically relevant. You know, acupuncture, I'm aware of a, a meta-analysis that looked at acupuncture for joint, uh, for knee um, osteoarthritis. And, you know, the evidence in terms of a clinically meaningful um, impact is pretty low. Uh, but anecdotally, some patients really swear that these things can help them a lot. So I put them in that, that, that basket of unlikely to do harm, yeah. may improve things, um, and combined with everything else, probably worth it, worth a worth try. Worth a try, again. someone's yep. willing. Yep. Capsaicin cream, is that another one? So that's that counter-irritant. Yeah, so yeah. You, it's like deep heat. You rub something on the skin. It makes the skin feel... Uh, unusual and it kind of distracts you from the pain. Right. So all those things um, are definitely a, a, a yeah. part of it. So if you're yeah. quite sore, those things can make your knee feel short term better, allow you to be more active, which in the longer term I think is probably good for your knee. Excellent. Mm. If I can ask you one final one, yeah. just because they're sort of barreling through. Yeah. Um, do you have a preferred one that you prescribe, and would you choose salicoxib, for example? Um, um, any comment on that? No, so I prescribe mostly naproxen. Mm -hmm. So that's based on some of the studies that showed that it was uh, had less of the association with cardiovascular risk, although I suspect that that's probably not real. I'm not sure that's been debunked yet. But that's and, and look, I think it's also a good analgesic. Um, I don't tend to prescribe uh, too many of the COX-2 inhibitors. Um, a lot of patients really like diclofenac. You know, it's it's mm. got good brand recognition, <laughs> so um, I use a bit of that. Yeah. Um, and then some patients, they, uh, they'll tell me that they don't like taking anti-inflammatories, but then they say that they're quite happy taking urofen. So yeah, I'll often prescribe ibuprofen and, and sure. that type of patient. Okay. So those would be the three that I prescribe by far and away the most. Do you use prednisone or a steroid? Sometimes, or a steroid? Yep, yeah, sometimes. So uh, patients that, to be honest, I think if I'm thinking about oral prednisone, usually I'll try injected right. steroid instead. Yeah. Injected steroid, so yeah. um, I think injected steroid um, went out of fashion a little bit for a while, um, but then with all the, the sort of evidence looking at the limitations of arthroscopies, I think um, corticosteroid is, is definitely worth looking at more closely. Um, particularly for this type of patient here where they've had quite bad pain for a fairly short period um, and you're really just trying to get that bad pain to settle down to try and get them back to normal activity, mm -hmm. um, you might consider, you know, with a uh, discussion about the pros and cons of that, you know, that might be something rather than arthroscopy. Any um, upper limit on how many you would do? Is the question on the uh, So... Um, Patients ask me that a lot, so um, I tell them that most of these stories are an old wives' tale, which is true, um, but there's an element of truth to everything. So I think if you try an injection and you get a good response, and so I'd say a good response is, you know, maybe it was quite a lot better for, you know, six months, and you think this is a joint that's heading nowhere good, then I would, you know, consider repeating the injection quite regularly as a means of deferring a joint replacement or allowing people to be active. Um, so, you know, at some point, that's not going to work anymore. Mm. Um, if you get a week's worth of relief, there's no point doing another one. Yeah. Um, there's no actual rules about this. So there's no upper limit in a lifetime. Um, there's no upper limit in a joint. Um, but generally, if you're using multiple injections over and over again, you have to, I guess, question whether that's a good long-term strategy. Sure, yeah.
And as I said, it's probably not good for the joint. Over time, yeah. yeah. There is one question that I'm, I'm sure will actually be quite relevant to everyone. You may be going to address it in one of your cases, I'm mm -hmm. not sure, but particularly related to older patients with back pain, yes. osteoarthritis, who may find it difficult to do the necessary exercise to achieve the weight loss. And yeah. Any sort of advice on that? I don't know if any of the cases are. Um, yeah. So I don't have one directly related to the back, but the back can be more challenging in that you know it's hard to, to you don't want to rest the back. But mm -hmm. I think actually a great patient today is 87, just an absolute legend of a guy. Um, he, he is addicted to tennis. Oh, okay. Um, and so he, he's played tennis his entire life. He's also addicted to having breakfast out at a cafe on K Road. Right. <laughs> and he has uh, he has eggs Benedict pretty much every day wow. for most of his life. Um, and so, you know, talking with him, it, he tried a bit of physio, he tried a bit of pain relief, then he got a bit of renal function uh, failure, so he couldn't take anti-inflammatories anymore. Um, and he's got multi-level degenerative disc disease, so he's not a target, you know, there's no injection that we're going to target. Um, but he, he eventually got to a point where he was really pretty sore, and then he stopped having X Benedict for the morning. He's just lost 11 kilos, right. and he's way better. Got so uh, I think sometimes be a bit, um, a bit more well off too after <laughs> <laughs> probably yeah. yeah. Although I'm not sure that's yeah. such an issue for this guy, but right. um, generally I think the simple things still work there, and it just mm. I think you have to get to a point where the patient is prepared to kind of engage in that. So um, that type of patient where they're quite sore, they often really like being in the water. So they might not like it from a, it doesn't make them feel good. They don't like wearing togs point of view, but if you can actually convince them to do it, the act of being in the water is quite liberating. Like right. they feel um, they've removed gravity, they feel better, they can move around. So that can be one option. I'm um, just getting them into some home-based basic stretching and activity. Sometimes that can make quite a big difference. And so engaging them with a physiotherapist or there are some um, community um, exercise type classes you can get into mm -hmm. through the green prescription. Yeah, I was going to say green prescription um, quite useful, especially for... There's a comment about the cost of physio for people who can't yeah, afford it. Yeah, yeah, look, I mean, sorry. that's very real. The, the other, and I guess there's a cost associated with this as well, but there are some some pretty useful YouTube things. So if you Google exercise um, and osteoarthritis, there are some quite nice YouTube clips that yeah. people can follow, um, you know, basic Pilates, basic core activation type exercise. And it comes back to that thing, basically anything is good. Um, if you can access some uh, time with a, nutrition, a dietitian, um, then um, if we can get them to lose some weight, that'll have an improvement. But yeah, it's, it's you know, look, it's challenging. So when people are older, they aren't as able to do stuff. Um, it's harder, but it, the approach generally is kind of the same. Find something that they like, that they're able to do, and uh, try and challenge them to do it. And look, I think following up with them reasonably quickly after that conversation is important too. How's this going? Have you had any problems? Are there some issues? Yeah. Um, the other thing is it's really important to try and find things that people like. So I see a lot of you know, ex-rugby players or footballers and they've been told uh, you've got to walk or you've got to right. swim. And they have no interest in walking or swimming. But if you can find something that's quite competitive for them, they really like that. So they're used to being in a sort of team environment, being competitive. And so things like boxing or being in a boxing class, that can be really useful. So... They can burn quite a lot of calories. It's not as hard on your lower limb uh, joints. Um, and, you know, it's fun with some camaraderie. Yeah, yeah, so sure. try and find, and, you know, table tennis is kind of the same. So, no, <laughs> so it sounds it. silly, but yeah, you know, yeah. table tennis is something that uh, yeah. most people can do. It's fun. There's, there's a ball. It's a game. Yeah. Um, so you can be sometimes more successful with those sorts of things rather than you must walk. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, think about the options. Um. There's just a question here while we're talking about sort of medicines before we move on, just bisphosphonates um, yeah. for pain in yep. particular. So there are some papers, um, mostly I think out of Adelaide, that look at bisphosphonates. So if you have someone with the papers I'm familiar with, they're looking at knee arthritis. So if you get an MRI scan and there's quite a lot of associated uh, bone edema, um, then using a bisphosphonate has been shown to improve pain and function and remove some of that edema. So um, that's something that we have uh, played around with in our clinic, um, but I can't say that I've been overwhelmed with the results. But you know, in some situations, that there may be a role for bisphosphonates. Yeah. yeah. Okay, well, that's great. Thank you.
Um, so look, this is the, the last case. So this is probably more what we think of when we think about patients with arthritis, and it's probably more aligned with um, the lumbar spine case that, uh, that a listener yeah. um, was talking to. So this is a 62-year-old woman, um, has a pretty sedentary life and doesn't do very much. Again, has pretty localized medial knee pain, which is sort of a common story with a medial compartment injury. Um, patellofemoral pain often gives you this very diffuse somewhere in front of the knee pain. So that's often, just as an aside, that's often something that's not well diagnosed. You can get an AP and lateral view and you don't really see the patellofemoral joint there. So um, if you see, think about that diffuse aching pain somewhere that's not so localized, think about getting a skyline view or a patella right. x-ray yeah. uh, because sometimes you'll get surprised by just how badly um, damaged right. that, that joint can be. Um, so this woman um, has constant pain. It's really bad. It's waking up at night and she is uh, she's overweight. So um, the main issues here, I think, in terms of trying to do something for this woman relate to her sedentary life and, and her elevated um, BMI. Um, and this is the sort of x-ray we see. So this really pronounced medial compartment change. Um, just on x-rays, this is a, a thing called a Rosenborg view. So the, the x-ray is taken with the patient standing and with the knee flexed a little bit. So we're seeing predominantly the weight-bearing surface of the joint. So you can be tricked a little bit sometimes if the patient is not standing up. So if they're sitting down, which right. often some x-rays are, sometimes the knee won't look too bad. And sometimes when they're standing erect, it doesn't look too bad. So um, I've had some patients where you get a non-weight-bearing x-ray, it doesn't look too bad. Then they stand up, looks a little bit worse. But then when they, they get their knee bent, it really looks pretty bad. So most of the radiology practices around town generally will give you four images. So a Rosenborg view, a standing AP, a lateral, and a skyline view. So if you're not getting that, I think you're getting shortchanged right. a little bit, particularly in the context of, of arthritis. So that doesn't look very good, medial compartment narrowing. Um, and so we know patients that have bad arthritis are more likely to do well with a, a joint replacement. But we also know that patient symptoms are relatively independent of what their x-ray shows. So this could be an incidental finding in an otherwise asymptomatic patient, in which case I'd really reassure them that it's not a big deal. Um, but then this patient, obviously, they are quite symptomatic. So this woman, just by virtue of uh, her x-ray, is probably more likely to end up having a joint replacement. But given her elevated BMI and sedentary life, she's probably not as likely to have a good outcome from her joint replacement. So explaining that whole concept we talked about before, prehabilitation, so can we get things to be as good as we possibly can be? Um, that will mean that if you do have a joint replacement, you'll do better. Um, and if we can get you to be better, you may not need a joint replacement. Um, being really clear about the influence of the, the weight and talking about that, um, quoting those statistics, if you can lose 5 to 10% of your body weight, you'll remove 50% of your symptoms. So people like those sorts of numbers. It's kind of tangible. Um, it, I would get a nutritionist involved in this uh, in this type of patient if you can, um, but otherwise having a you know a pretty good conversation about diet. And I, I kind of look for the low-hanging fruit. So some patients will stop at the same bakery on the way to work every day and get a pie. Um, if I come home from work and there's a gap between getting home and eating dinner, I'll fill that with a, a block of blue cheese. Yeah. So for me, sure. that's the thing that would have the, the biggest impact time. in my yeah. life. Yeah. So there's usually yeah. some low-hanging fruit and then just yeah. a general conversation about what is your diet like? Um, where are the areas for improvement? Um, there's a real fad around the low-carb um, high fat diet. Yeah, there's a lot of, um, a lot of patients asking so about that. Yeah. I don't know that that's a sustainable diet. I wouldn't be that interested in it myself. But there's no doubt that people that embrace that diet lose a ton of weight, um, at least for a time. So I think that that's something that you, you could talk about. Um, but generally, just a general calorie restriction is the way to go. Um, in the short term, being a bit aggre more aggressive with some analgesics and trying to manage the patient's pain. Um, you could consider a corticosteroid injection, although you need to consider is this how likely is this patient to get a joint replacement in the next 6 to 12 months, and is the surgeon likely to be worried about that? So it might be a conversation that you have with um, your neighbourhood orthopaedic surgeon. Um, but then trying to get them more active, so bike or pool, and encouraging them to do that even if it's a little bit uncomfortable. I think that's always a difficult conversation to have with people who haven't been active. It's yeah. all but it hurts, and it's... I guess agreeing that yeah. um, 
that can be a little bit uncomfortable, but like yeah. stop if it's so. I, I kind of things. my approach to this is probably not the most politically correct. So I, I try and put the fear of God into them a little bit about the knee replacement because yeah. often they don't appreciate what that involves, and I'll explain that the recovery time for that is six or twelve months, and it may be a good option for them, but you don't want to go into that without um, considering the other options. And I talked to him about that treatment pyramid and saying, look, there are some things that are pretty simple here that don't involve surgery that may make a tangible difference for you. And some patients are open to hearing that, some are not. Yeah. Um, explaining that because they have a, a, an elevated BMI um, and they're overweight, they're less likely to do well with the surgery. So big surgery that you're maybe not going to do that well from. Um, those things do resonate with people. And I think that uh, that, that can have quite a significant impact on the, their ability to buy in. And then considering things like joint replacement, um, this is the sort of patient that we think in our, with our multidisciplinary clinic, um, we can help quite a bit. Yeah. 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 So um, more likely than the other two cases to need a joint replacement in the short term, but certainly all the other things are worth considering. How are we going? Right. Yeah, no, we're going well. We've had a few um, a useful comments from someone saying, don't forget about referring for hospital-based physiotherapists. Yes, um, definitely. Which is obviously free access, so thank you for that. Um, good reminder. Any um, problems that you're aware of of a high load when cycling with knee yeah. osteoarthritis in particular? So the, the harder patients pedal, yeah. the more likely they are to have a problem. So okay. um, if they, you know, a spin class, for example, in a gym where patients are really tr trying hard, they're getting up out of their pedals, that's quite likely to aggravate their knee. It's closer sure. to running. Yeah. Um, so what I'm talking about with cycling and with this type of patient anyway is can we just get your knee moving? Turn the resistance down to nothing. Um, the idea is to polish your knee, um, read a book, don't try and get a big workout, just try and get your yeah. knee moving. Try and just move yeah. the knee. Yeah, so um, you certainly can hurt people's knee with a bike. Would you also suggest uh, requesting those four views for x-ray yeah. up front? Yeah, yeah definitely. We might so, put that on the... On the um, Webinar link actually. Okay. Just so when I um, on my patient yeah. management software, the request defaults to requesting all four of those views. Right. So um, okay. AP weight bearing yeah. AP lateral Rosenborg and skyline view. Those right. are the ones I think we should go for. We'll pop that up um, with the webinar on the website after this, so people can refer back to it. Yeah. Cool. Um, and I think. Have we come to the end of that case? Or uh, we we yeah, have, yeah. So right. um, I guess I was going to wrap up a little bit. Yeah, um, yeah. So I, I think trying to change the dialogue a little bit. So you're too uh, good for a joint replacement, come back, might be better to say um, the advice is this is a really common problem. You may never need surgery. If you can get moving and lose a bit of weight, um, you, you might have no symptoms anymore. So that maybe is a, a better um, message to get from the orthopedic surgeon or or uh, um, up front. And I think the takeaway messages for me are, you know, the money here is in the lifestyle changes. So if we can facilitate people becoming more active and losing some weight, we dramatically reduce the risk of them needing to move up that pyramid. Um, analgesics can be pretty good. And I don't think we should be afraid of anti-inflammatories. We need to be aware of the, the pros and cons and the type of patient that, that doesn't do so well on them and minimize the dose and duration of treatment. Um, some of the injection options, there are a range. So the patient that's not going so well, um, you might consider a PRP injection or you might consider visco supplementation. Um, so those are in your arsenal. Um, and uh, you know, if you have more significant symptoms or more significant x-ray findings, then obviously you're starting to think about joint replacements and, and whether those things are more likely to be required. So um, that, that's essentially the talk. Uh, I'm aware that there may be some more questions. And uh, you know, thank you all out there for listening. Yeah, no, that's great. Thank you, Matt. I might um just put a couple of questions to you at the end just to cover sure. off some ones that haven't quite fit in other places during the talk. No problem. Um, one quick question on intra-articular steroid injection. Yeah. Any association with that um, and adrenal suppression that you're aware of? Um, so there is some systemic uptake. Yeah. Um, so putting the, the steroid in the joint, most of the effect is local. Um, so I it could, in theory, happen, but it wouldn't be common, and you would probably need to be having multiple injections over a period of time. Right. So it's not a major risk, but it is a consideration, you know, in the same way of prescribing um, or, or, or prednisone and other types of steroids. Sure, yeah, that makes sense. 
Um, we have had a dietitian listening tonight who was interested in the specifics of yeah. the dietary um, management. I think we kind of covered that earlier in the talk with yeah, a little saying bit. that the, you know the main goal is really be so, high reduction. That's to right. The specifics. Yeah. So yeah. I, I, look, I, I think to a, a good dietitian and uh, some motivational interviewing is really really important here. Yeah. So I think you need to clearly give the patient the message that that is losing weight is a really important part of this, and probably it's it's the biggest benefit. So um, having that message sold in as many different ways as we can is important. Oh, that's great. Look, I think that probably we've covered off the main uh, big question. So I guess great. well, it's just to thank you very much for that. It's just great to <laughs> talk that through, and thanks everyone for listening. And yeah. Tune in next time for our next um, webinar with Dr. Mark Thomas. We'll see you all later. Thank you very much.